Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at the impact of the war on society and family life. We hear now from Dr Rosie Kennedy about children's experience of the First World War. I'm Rosie Kennedy. I work at Goldsmiths, part of the University of London. I specialise in modern British history, but my particular research interest is a history of childhood, specifically children's experience of the First World War, both the way that they understood the war through their interaction with adults, education, participation in organised uniform youth groups, which were hugely popular during the First World War, but also through books and toys made by adults for them to enjoy. The other thing I'm interested in is the way that children came to understand the war for themselves. So how children responded to the war and engaged with it on their own or with each other. There's lots of interest in education at this time. Progressive ideas about child-centred learning, opportunities for teachers to think about a child-centred curriculum and the way in which the education system should be expanded to take children further into secondary education. This is relevant because one of the things you see in the First World War is the way in which the war becomes part of the life of the school, partly because teachers think this is the sort of thing children should be learning about and understanding, but also because children, they're interested in the war. It's having a big impact on their own family circumstances if they have fathers or brothers fighting. They see the way in which the adults around them are preoccupied by war. In terms of the curriculum, you see teachers looking quickly to find ways in which to incorporate war-related lessons into their teaching. There's lots of interest in the history and geography of the combatant nations and there are textbooks produced quite quickly in the war to try and explain the causes of war but also the longer history of diplomatic relations between nations, geographical boundaries of nations, the backstory, if you like, to the present crisis. Drawing classes, for example, often children are given a theme like a great naval battle and then their drawing exercise that day is to recreate that scene. Or woodwork where instead of making little toolboxes, they'll be making dummy rifles or other war-themed products. Lots of classrooms have maps on the wall where each day the children follow the progress of the war, marking out the front lines and the major battle points. Lessons in composition, for example, children will be set war-related topics, the war saving scheme or their favourite military heroes. They are also being encouraged to write to soldiers or make comforts. The children are involved in knitting, collecting cigarettes or food to make up parcels that are being sent out by the schools to British troops. A popular thing is to send them out to old boys. There was some concern, particularly from the teaching unions and teachers' organisations, that they didn't want the teaching of war-related subjects to become jingoistic. A quote from a paper for school teachers says, we don't want to encourage national animosities. We want this teaching to encourage peace in the future. So it must be as balanced as possible. It's very clearly supportive of the British position, but it isn't overtly anti-German which is surprising given much of what you read in the popular press at the time. One of the most visible ways in which children contributed to the home front war effort was through their involvement in uniformed youth groups. These have begun to take off from the end of the 19th century with the formation of the Boys Brigade in Glasgow in the 1880s. The Boy Scouts were begun in 1908 by the famous soldier Robert Baden-Powell, hero of Mafeking, become hugely popular Girls aren't far behind. In the 1909 Boy Scout rally at Crystal Palace, a group of girls gatecrash the occasion, hoping to be accepted as Girl Scouts. They've set up their own group and they want to take part in the same sorts of activities that their brothers are enjoying. So in 1909, Baden-Powell published a pamphlet called Girl Guides, a Suggestion for Character Training for Girls. And by 1912, he's encouraged his sister Agnes to produce another one called The Handbook for Girl Guides or How Girls Can Help Build the Empire. 
During the war, the uniformed youth groups quickly offer their services to local police stations, local hospitals, local offices, and undertake a whole range of roles, sounding the all clear after air raid warnings, serving as military dispatch cyclists, working for local government as messengers. When war breaks out in August 1914, many of these scout troops are on their summer camp. So there's lots of examples of local police officers coming to the camp and giving all the boys whistles and asking them to guard the local railway cutting or the reservoir that's nearby. Although for girl guides, their focus up until this point has been on motherhood and health and hygiene, there is much more recognition that the war is going to provide opportunities for all sorts of other roles outside of the home. So the guides are quickly encouraged to increase their training in first aid, to be prepared to take in wounded, for example, if there are air raids. There's lots of encouragement for both boys and girls to be prepared for what to do in case of invasion. Girls also begin to take on a more visible public role. They work in local hospitals, in local government offices, doing similar sorts of work to the boys. Baden-Powell maintains quite a lot of involvement in the Girl Guides. He writes regularly for their newspaper. Baden-Powell's new wife, Olav Baden-Powell, takes over the lead of the Girl Guides. She's a much younger woman, much more interested in moving, guiding forward and opening up these new opportunities for girls. But they don't want Girl Guides marching in the streets with recruiting processions. They think the nation would be much more impressed if girls are quietly getting on with things behind the scenes. That's more likely to encourage adults to fulfil their wartime roles. As well as learning about the war through their experiences in the classroom and through their involvement in uniform youth groups, children are also exposed to the themes of war through the books and magazines that they read. There's a whole host of publications on offer, lots of boys' magazines, as well as more expensive commercially produced books. There are similar but fewer in number of these publications aimed at girls. War as a theme isn't really anything new. The imperial adventure genre has been huge in the late 19th century. What happens when the First World War breaks out is that the action of these stories is transposed from an imperial setting onto the Western Front. We often see stories of underage boys who've managed to enlist and over the course of the war they manage to serve in the navy the trenches and often make it into the flying corps so these are tales packed with action and adventure where the war is presented as an extraordinary opportunity for heroism and adventure Stories aimed at girls offer their readers examples of ways in which women were contributing to the war effort. These are books written by women, so you see heroines as munitions workers, as land girls, as drivers. All of the girls in these stories are ready to get stuck in. They're enthusiastic, capable, hardworking and hanging on to their womanly charms as well. So although they might foil spy rings, they're also concerned about their appearance and make terrifically good jam. Younger children are also encouraged to engage with the language and imagery of warfare through picture books. There are some very beautiful alphabet and counting books, charming examples like Our Soldiers and ABC for Little Britons. B for the bugler sounding his call, C for the camp where he wakens them all, D for the drummer boy rat-a-pat plan, find better music than his if you can. But there were also some slightly less charming examples. There's a collection of nursery rhymes which includes a foreword explaining that there should be no objection to introducing some of the more serious themes of war to young children because, of course, they're exposed to it every day through the lives of their family. One of the most horrible I've come across is a take on the House That Jack Built nursery rhyme. And it goes, This is the house that Jack built. This is the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the Hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the gun that killed the Hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the man in navy blue that fired the gun that killed the Hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. And it goes on. So you can see from this that some of these books pull no punches in terms of the themes of war that they're offering to really very young children. 
Children's toys is another area where we see the war become part of the products offered to entertain children. Again, war as a theme was nothing new. Britain had a long history of toy soldier manufacturing. So by 1914, Britain is already producing 10 to 11 million toy soldier figures annually. What you see once the war breaks out is manufacturers really trying to cash in on the war fever, the enthusiasm for war. For example, in the run-up to Christmas 1914, there's a huge outpouring of advertising for all sorts of products for the Christmas market. Board games where you can recruit your way across Britain or others where you can fight your way across France. One of my favourites is an indoor golf game complete with golf clubs and miniature balls and little citadels where you put your way to Germany. There are forts, castles, battlefields, all sorts of miniature guns for you to fire. There's one where you get points for every fort you hit and you lose points if you hit the Red Cross tent. One of the most horrible was an exploding trench produced by Britain's toy manufacturers. It was about a foot long made of cardboard and when you fired your gun at the little target, the soldiers inside would be thrown into the air with a loud explosion. This product wasn't on the market for very long. I think even the toy manufacturers realised that there was a limit to what parents were going to be happy to see played with by their children at home. The toy manufacturers are desperate to have the latest thing and their models are very good replicas. There are dolls and toy figures dressed in British and Allied uniforms. There are Red Cross dolls, Munitionette dolls, Any sort of war-related role finds its way into miniature form for children. The products are sharply divided on gender lines, although that's not to say that boys and girls weren't playing with each other's toys. In the first couple of years of war, these toys are really heavily advertised. There are new lines coming out all the time. Although once that initial enthusiasm for war has settled down into war weariness, you begin to see a bit of a move away from war-themed toys. There's also beginnings of a backlash towards the end of the war about some of the more, what they would have called, ghastly representations of war. For example, there were lots of toy hospitals aimed particularly at girls. I came across a newspaper article condemning one which had figures representing wounded soldiers, legless, armless, showing the human cost of war in a way that perhaps some people were becoming uncomfortable with. And certainly we see in the years after the war quite a big move away from some of these war-themed toys. So lots of the manufacturers of toy soldiers have to branch out. You see many more farm animals and civilian scenes on offer in model form. For many children, their most immediate connection to the war was through the involvement of family members. Millions of children in Britain had fathers, brothers, uncles, cousins, neighbours, teachers, friends serving in the armed forces. And it was through their relationships with those soldiers that many children had their most personal connection to the war. During the war itself, periods of leave were often few and far between. And so for these children, it was letters that enabled them to maintain their contact with usually their father, but perhaps other close male relatives. In looking at the correspondence between children and their fathers, we can see the ways in which they were trying to maintain their bonds despite this huge separation that they had, both in terms of distance but also in terms of experience. Children on the home front had very little understanding of what life was like for their fathers and equally fathers were keen to reassure their children that they were safe and that the experience they were having was not wholly negative. In the letters that fathers are sending to their very young children, they're very preoccupied with the changes that they're going to see in their children when they come home. They've been away for years sometimes of these young children's lives and in that time their children have changed. They themselves might not be remembered particularly well by these young children. So what they try to do is to create an image of themselves on the page that their children can relate to. They write to their children of where they're living, they draw pictures of the tents they're staying in, they describe 
describe the animals that are around them and the other children that they've met nearby and their soldier friends. Children respond in similar ways, so they write to their fathers all about the intimate domestic details of family life, of their friendships, of school, of their pets. To older children, men are sometimes prepared to be more forthcoming. You read letters that bear lots of similarities to some of the fiction that children are being offered, describing the war as this great adventure that they're having, funny stories of launching dead rats into the German trenches. But we also see men writing to children of quite frightening occasions like gas attacks and witnessing the civilian cost of war, local populations fleeing German advance and things like that. So it's not the case that men are hiding their war experience from their children necessarily, just that they're trying to find ways in which they can make their experience safe for their children. What might surprise modern audiences is the fact that the First World War was not shielded from children. Children were expected to understand it, to be interested in it, to play a role in the home front war effort and to understand the potential consequences if Britain didn't maintain morale and continue to a successful prosecution of the war. So children are very much involved. They're taught about it at school. They're encouraged to participate in local efforts to save, collect, make products that are needed for the war effort. And children are interested. They're keen to do their part. They see the effect it's having on the adults around them and they are keen to be given the opportunity to make a contribution. That was Dr Rosie Kennedy on children's experience of the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Mary Cox about the challenges of keeping Britain fed during the First World War.